Hi, this is Susan Nash, and I'm here today to talk to you about panelist presentation guidelines. So let's say you've been accepted for a panel discussion, and you have the option to talk for a few minutes and give a presentation of like one or two slides before the question and answers and the interrogation begins. <laughs> and so basically you'll be giving a talk on a on a, a theme, but you just basic, basically want to have one main idea and you want it to tie in to the overall theme so that that everyone is pretty much stimulated to participate and, and to generate interesting questions and interaction. So let's just take a look at what we would do next. So what we want to do is think about how to spark a panel discussion. So if we have an optional five minute presentation with a slide or two slides, what are the key things that we want to do or be? Okay, first, you want it to be brief, provocative, relevant to the audience, which presupposes that you actually know your audience and what your audience's beliefs and values are and why they're there. You also want to make sure that your panel discussion or your brief presentation is grounded in reality and grounded in the kind of reality that your audience can relate to. And then you want to have at least one meaningful takeaway so that afterwards the people in the audience could say, oh, they said this or that <laughs> about the, the, what you said. They would at least have one um, main insight or um, touch point. So let's think about the slides that you'll use. How does your slide focus the audience? So you want to keep your map or diagram large and clear. You want it to tell a story. So this one is talking about the um, massive Yellowstone caldera that is potentially going to explode any minute. And when it does, when it erupts, there could be a massive cloud that could cover a region 500 miles wide. So see how this, this um, slide just most definitely tells a story. Keep your message simple. This is the, side, the cloud. And this is the extent of the ash beds. Um, then let the slide kick off your story. So, like, as they're talking about the cloud covering a region 500 miles wide, obviously there's some kind of story. Now, this is not my slide, so I don't know what the story really is, but I can guess. So you have a long valley caldera, and then you have these, like, ash beds, and they were massive. So the, I guess that the idea is that um, the past is the key to the present. Whatever ash bed is can be found in the rock record today from a past eruption could potentially be the same um, for now or the future. It's a lot of ash. <laughs> well, and then the slide can kick off your story. So you can go back to the slide, talk to it, the point, um, touch points, emotionally connect with your audience. And as you go through your slide, take your audience on a, a brief journey, an exploration of, of a concept or um, some kind of knowledge discovery. So let's think about how your slide tells your story. I just love these types of illustrations where people, a person has gone into a lot of effort to actually tell a story almost like looking at a graphic novel. So here we have a speaking picture. I'm referring to Sir Philip Sidney's uh, a defense of poesy, which he wrote in the 16th century for that. But he, he, he basically said um, uh, that poetry should tell a story. Now, when he said that, he was referring back to Horace, who said, ut pintura poesis, which means out of the picture comes poetry. In other words, knowledge, interpretive, interpretation, meaning, and often multiplicities of meaning. 
So you have your illustrative map or flowchart, and notice you want to build in enough complexity where you can have multiple places of interpretation and, and multiple ways where it's telling a story. Diagrams do that. And then in this case, the image, this image is a composite image, represents the whole topic. So what's the best structure of your brief presentation? You want to have your main idea, the goal of your presentation, and then key aspects of the main idea so that you make sure they're effective touch points and they keep your audience interested. So when I say touch points, what do I mean? What am I touching upon? Um, well, it's a good question. <laughs> You'll be touching upon your audience's experience, their emotions, but mainly you want to engage the emotions so that they pay attention and their mind is receptive to accepting meaning and contributing their own meanings. Then also ask the audience to consider your points and to form an opinion. So let's think about graphics. Here's a guide for graphics. Use a large font, uh, judicious use of color, clear talking points, and you want an illustrative graphic that holds the audience's interest. So this is the Alachua sink. Now I would say that the um, <laughs> fonts are kind of teeny tiny for, for a public presentation. I doubt that anybody would be able to read Alachua Sink extends for half a mile along the foot of the bluff of the prairie's north edge. However, these could be useful notes that you can refer to as you're um, speaking, not reading, <laughs> speaking. And then think about it, okay, obviously this is a sinkhole, right? And it's karst topography, it's limestone, well, as it says, we kind of know that if you're a geologist. And then it's so fascinating to see the aquifer and what has happened with um, subaerial erosion and then the wet sink, clay l layer, dry sink. But it's um, there's a boardwalk so you can walk along the, the swamps and not have to wade through alligators and the random escaped... <laughs> boa constrictor or blonde anaconda. So, so this entire, entire um, diagram, cross, cutaway, cross section, tells a nice story. It tells a geological story, it tells a human, um, human um, adventure story, or it could, and it also tells about potential for the future. So you can tell the, hold the audience's interest, and then your, your graphics should have the appropriate level of resolution, and also be sensitive to cultural differences. So um, one type of symbol may mean one thing to one audience and another thing to another. So let's just step back a minute and think about Giambattista Vico in um, Cienza Nuova from 1725. Gian Battista Vico was a rhetorician and a philosopher um, in Italy, 18th century, and he was he's been largely credited for for establishing the precepts used in the philosophy of science and the history of science, and the idea that I mean that under, underpins any time you do a lit review. <laughs> Think, oh, why am I doing a literature review? Or what, what's the history of this idea? Gian Battista Vico said it really matters. He says we can learn from the inventions and innovative thinking of the past, and that truth is verified not through simply observing, and he understood that observation often introduces cognitive bias. So you see things through your, like what Kant would call synthetic a priori, what your rose-colored glasses was well, verified through creation and creativity, not just through confirmation bias. Human beings construct their own knowledge systems, which can either limit you or empower you to reach out and apply to other areas or endeavors. So, speaking of 
rose-colored glasses or synthetic a priori. Let's put on our free samples of x-ray glasses so we can see through to what's be to the, the bones of the structure of this thing. So what are our conclusions? We're continuing our well, we have conclusions in our panel discussion or are we, are we wanting people to start continuing the conversation? I think we want to trigger people. So ideally your talk has given your audience tools to help them see in a new way. And then now what? Convert ideas into actions, thoughts into ongoing conversations, and as Vico would say, um, in, in discussing the past, think about an innovative new way to look at the future. So I hope this has been helpful, and I'm Susan Nash. I'm your guide on getting prepared for your panel discussion. Thank you.